one thing that um, that they decided to do in the late 70s is a PBS, a public broadcasting show in the U.S. called Free to Choose. That a lot of this was kind of Rose's idea. You know, hey, you've you know, you're developing all these ideas. You know, let's go out and you know, ex you can explain them to people in ways that they can understand and they can apply in their own lives. Hello and welcome to the Essential Scholars podcast series. I'm your host, Rosemary Fike, and today we're going to be discussing two women who are pretty well known for collaborating with their famous husbands, but they don't always get enough credit for being pretty <laughs> phenomenal economists in their own right. Um, Mary Paley and Rose Director. Joining me today in this conversation is Dr. Lynn Kiesling. Dr. Kiesling is a research professor in the College of Engineering, Design, and Computing at the University of Colorado, Denver, and co-director for the Institute for Regulatory Law and Economics. She's also an adjunct professor within Northwestern Master, Northwestern's Master of Science in Energy and Sustainability program. And she's the author of the chapter in The Essential Women of Liberty on these two phenomenal scholars. Thank you so much, Lynn. Oh, thanks for having me. So I want, one thing I love about the chapter that you do is you refer to both of these women by their family names and, and not immediately by their married names um, to really drive home that these were intellectuals in their own right. Um, but our listeners might better know these women by their married names. So yes. we've got Mary Paley Marshall and Rose Director Friedman. So one of the unifying themes of this chapter is really how these women were able to find their own way to contribute their ideas to the discipline of economics, despite facing incredible limitations. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit, especially about Mary Paley and, and what she was able to do because she was you know, working at an earlier time period yeah, Mary Paley, and, and I stumbled upon I, uh, a co-authored article by Mary Paley Marshall and Alfred Marshall uh, from the, I think, from the early 1880s, um, and this was probably 12 years ago. I was working on something, and I happened to stumble on this thing, and I'm like, whoa, Mary Paley. And so that got me very curious. And I started doing some digging and, and discovered that, you know, that she was a really uh, quite serious economist and quite a um, good intellectual companion and partner to, to her husband. Uh, what's, there are a lot of things I find really interesting about her and some of that owning my own bias. I'm a, a huge fan of 19th century British, you know, Victorian economic history, Victorian intellectual history. And so, you know, the, the, the social and cultural context of the Victorian period in Britain is really interesting. So she's born in 1850 her father is is a, a Anglican minister, and uh, her grandfather William Paley was a famous philosopher, and so she's born into a very intellectually inclined family, and uh, but you know the Victorian period has all of these kind of mores and cultural norms around what constitutes appropriate conduct and behavior for young ladies and so on and and you know it's it's uh, it's not clear that she in any way violated any of those but in addition to those kind of social and cultural strictures she was fortunate to be brought up in an intellectual environment where her father encouraged her education and her curiosity and, you know, this is a period when, you know, uh, when girls would go to school and they would learn basic, 
you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, they would learn um, maybe if they were in a, in a sort of upper class family, they would learn some French and maybe some Italian. And otherwise they would learn music and needlework and, you know, the, the kind of genteel graces. <laughs> the the well-educated woman learns how to be a nice companion. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and so her father, uh, she and her sister were educated in math beyond just regular arithmetic, you know, into geometry, trigonometry, algebra, and so on. And um, they learned German. And because they learned German, they had a German uh, governess, I think, at one point. And they were able to read some of the scientific literature in, in German. So they had some more exposure to, to science than your usual uh, girl's education would have. And so she grew up having a lot of exposure to math and science uh, beyond what you would expect. And, and I think that's really great. And, and I think her father encouraged curiosity and um, she was one of the first women to apply to go to Cambridge University as a student. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was, it was one of those weird things, right? So it's in the 1870s and uh, she, um, she was in one of the first five women. There was a class of five women who entered Newnham College, which was a newly established college at Cambridge in 1871. And so she was one of the first five women to attend Cambridge uh, and, you know, the, and the way, just for, for those who aren't familiar with how Oxford and Cambridge work, they're universities overall, but basically your academic life is within your college. And so each, uh, there are, you know, several colleges within Cambridge and, you know, Trinity and King's and so on. And so Newnham is a newly established college for women. They start with these five students and uh, and and the um, the economics faculty sends over a couple of tutors to teach them economics. One of them is this newly hired scholar named Alfred Marshall, and so um, you know, he's he's the tutor. He's a women's tutor, and interestingly, he's got kind of an interesting story himself over the course of their relationship. Um, you know, at first he's very egalitarian and very much about women's opportunities and so on. And that's why he is excited to go teach at Nuno. His thinking evolves over the course of the next few decades, which maybe we can discuss. But um, I did some when uh, researching this podcast, um, I stumbled upon that information myself and, and I'm glad we'll we'll table that and bring it up. OK. <laughs> So, so she's learning math and econ and, and really is digging into the economics and doing very um, high level work. Uh, she takes the, the graduating exams, that, the same exams as the male students take uh, to graduate. And she passes all of them and, and gets, you know, does very well on them. But of course, <laughs> Typical, typical. Um, they don't, Cambridge does not grant degrees to these five women. So it's like, okay, we're going to let you come study and we're going to set up a college, but we're not going to grant you a degree. And you're like, but wait. <laughs> Even though she took the same kind of coursework, passed the same exams with honors. And yep. yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it was still, a, you know, it, it was progress, but still a steep uphill um, progression. And uh, so she finished and she stayed on at Newnham as a lecturer. And so, so she then became one of the, one of the instructors and they continued to expand, um, expand the, the number of, of women in the, in the college. Um, and then at, at some point, I think in 1877, the, the, um, they, she and Alfred got married. Uh, they moved to Bristol. He had a, a faculty appointment in Bristol and they were there for a couple of years and then they were at Oxford for a little bit. But then he got appointed to a, a faculty position um, at Cambridge. And so they came back and then she taught at Newnham 
from I think it's 1885 to 1916. So, yeah. You know, how, how did they pay her? Oh, that's right. <laughs> so at Bristol, um, she she did teach. She had a lecturer post at Bristol, but they only paid her out of her husband's salary. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bless these women who were yep. able to weather all of that so that you and I didn't have to do that. Yeah. And, and so, and she was definitely, I would call her as someone, she was kind of quietly tenacious. You know, she just was very tenacious and just stuck with things and just chipped away at it. Um, and she was willing to, to suffer some of these indignities. Um, but, and then when, in terms of the, the work that she did, um, you know, some of the, the work that she did in the 1870s and early 1880s really formed the foundations of this growing um, applied microeconomic theory that was, that was developing. You know, 1871 is the year that we kind of benchmark for what we call the marginal revolution. And, and her husband is one of the names that comes up with that movement. Yep. And so we think of, so the 1871, uh, separately and independently from each other in Austria and Switzerland and Britain, you've got three different people coming up with this new marginal, marginal way of thinking, marginal analysis, you know, thinking incrementally about problems and, um, you know, and that's right when she's showing up to Cambridge. So, you know, this is the new hot thing. And her tutor, Alfred, who's her future husband, is teaching the new hot thing. And so they're, and, and they're developing and applying this new marginal analysis based microeconomic theory uh, as they go and, and in their interactions with each other. And so they do co-author a little bit, as you mentioned, you came across one of their papers and they do have a book that they co-authored mm -hmm. together, I believe. Yep. And that was the, the one that, um, and I would definitely say it, it is worth going back to if you're interested in, in the subject. This is uh, called The Economics of Industry in 1879. Uh, and it's the only co-authored work between them. And, um, it's worth going back and looking at if you're interested in economic thought, because it's definitely starting to build out this idea of the microeconomic theory of production and kind of cost based, all of the kind of cost based analysis that we do. And, you know, that firms are going to maximize their profits when marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, all of that all of that stuff that's bread and butter for, for economists these days is stuff that they're developing. And that book in particular, the publisher's uh, charge to them was to write up this new, this new field of microeconomic theory in a way that is accessible. You know, so basically if you're writing a textbook for these women who are coming to study at Newnham College, Cambridge, you know, that's what this book should be. And so it's written in a in a way that is very clear and and accessible, um, and then ultimately uh, gets folded into the work that Alfred publishes in 1890, his seminal pathbreaking work, Principles of Economics. And so a lot of the ideas that were in that book that is very well recognized as one of the most important contributions um, in, in economics, a lot of it did come from the collaborations that they, the collaboration that they had on the earlier textbook. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, and he, in the acknowledgments in, in the 1890 work, he acknowledges uh, Mary is, and recognizes her contributions, but I think um, the other thing that is is important to know is that Alfred Marshall had a, a bit more of a nervous temperament. You know, he was a bit of a perfectionist. Probably had these days we'd probably say he had a touch of anxiety. 
and and so he, he um, I think part of what um, their collaboration meant initially was she was not just talking through ideas with him, developing her own ideas and sharing them with him, but also providing him kind of emotional support and and that she was there as kind of a, um, you know, someone for him to bounce ideas off of as well as having her own ideas. And that helped him to focus in a way that enabled him to be more productive. That's that's how I interpret their oh, relationship. Yeah. As somebody who struggles with anxiety, you can get very inside of your head about is this idea terrible? So having that yeah. external validation mm -hmm. that your idea is not in fact a bad idea um, can really help work through and, and make progress on things. So that okay. is a very hard to measure kind of contribution. Yeah. But I do think, um, I mean, and, and some of this, I think, is it was his his idea, but that she certainly reinforced it, that one of the things that, that Marshall is famous for in the 1890 work is that um, he put all of the technical economics, all the math, all the graphs in footnotes. Mm -hmm. And so if you're reading, you're reading his 1890 work, it's narrative. And he's explaining to you you know, he's explaining what price elasticity of demand is and what it means. And he's putting the derivation and the math and the graphs and everything in the footnotes. And of course, these days, right, all the, the econ students look in the footnotes and they're like, oh, that's where demand curves come from. And, but um, at the time that they were developing it, you know, they very much wanted to prioritize being able to articulate the ideas in English and have the, the technical support uh, in, the, in the footnotes. I truly wish that graduate school looked more like that for me. <laughs> Instead of having to buy an entirely different textbook to translate the mathematical textbook that I was using. Yep. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned in the chapter is that she had a pretty important impact on at least the economic students um, at her university after uh, she and her mm -hmm. husband both passed away. She was a good steward of resources in that way. Yeah, so she, um, one of the things that, that Alfred Marshall and Henry Sidgwick, who was another kind of economist of that same period, uh, you know, and they're they're starting to really develop Cambridge as a core, you know, a, a, a core center of economic theory. And uh, one of the things that they do to help with this is they establish a student library. And so they contribute some of their own books and they start a student library. And then, you know, as, as they, you know, have children and, and, you know, Mary's, um, uh, career evolves, you know, first she's, she's a lecturer at, at Newnham college through 1916. And, but then after that, she takes on, uh, leadership of this library. And, uh, then I think, I think Marshall himself dies in 1924 and she lives for about another 20 years after that and uh, really you know becomes the head you know the head of this library and it becomes the Marshall Library at Cambridge and so she really takes on the leadership to enable the library to grow into uh, a serious professional scholarly library for economics uh, at Cambridge and she does that almost almost up the up to up to her death so she's very intellectually engaged uh, with the the intellectual life of the university for all of her life. Um, and really beyond, because that's mm -hmm. a that's a gift that keeps on giving yep. generations to come. Big legacy. Um, so I do want to get back to the thing that you kind of alluded to. Um, I did stumble upon a, a bit of information that, you know, throughout Alfred's life, he became um, 
increasingly obstructive to the cause of women's education and changed his view, um, believing that women did not have many useful things to say. Um, did you stumble upon this as well, I'm assuming? I did. Um, I did. I, I, and it's interesting because it, it really, to me, it's an oddity. It's, I guess I would call it a lacuna if I were a philosopher, but it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's out of character with some of the rest of his, you know, so in terms of his economics, you know, he's very, um, in many ways for a Victorian gentleman of his class, he's very uh, more egalitarian than you would expect. Mm -hmm. And earlier, as I said earlier in his career, he's very uh, encouraging of women's educational opportunities. Um, and I have to admit, I've never been really satisfied that I've, I've found a good explanation of why he changed his mind. So I don't mm -hmm. know if you found anything that that you found useful? I did not. I just, I found a few statements just kind of saying that this is his view changed and that um, when they were questioning whether or not to give women degrees, he actually had uh, objected to Cambridge mm -hmm. starting to award degrees, which was really surprising to me because of his wife's lived experience. And you would you would imagine that if his wife had something to say about that, she would have maybe encouraged him to allow it or to support it at least. Yeah, and and I'm not I'm not sure what what there was in their relationship dynamic, but but she definitely, you know, let him be his own person, think his thing, and um, and disagreed with him clearly, you know, given how long she kept on in her uh, in her faculty position but um, it's it's just very odd because in in other ways I mean the the work he was doing was not ideological in any way but he was very much a classical liberal right and then very um, you know self-determination individual agency um, let people decide for themselves um, you know, in, in, he didn't quite carry the marginal analysis quite as far down the kind of Karl Menger epistemology, you know, prices contain nuggets of diffuse private knowledge. He didn't go fully down that road, but he was, right. he was right there. <laughs> and, and so, um, this is a weird time though, in, in British culture, um, you know, because he and he's very influenced by Darwin, mm -hmm. which is another. Um, and, and it's not clear how much Mary was influenced by Darwin, but but Alfred certainly was. And um, and so you know, he has this this focus on the kind of underlying dynamics of systems. Although his economics is very much okay, let's take a dynamic system and let's be a little reductionist and use a static framework to analyze it so that we can kind of get our arms around it. Um, but, but this is also a time where, you know, you, you have this growing eugenics movement and um, different things having to do with race and class. You've got yeah, so the, the original institutionalists are mm -hmm. in their kind of prominent position in the, in, in the, um, yeah, he, he, I think he may have, found some of the suffragette activities a bit objectionable and was probably hostile to some of their tactics. And that might have, might have changed some of his opinions about women's education, but that's just speculation on my part. Well, as many husbands and wives have disagreements, um, I want to turn to Rose director who is um, known for being the only person who could win an argument with Milton Friedman, her husband. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I love that little piece of information. Yep. The only person to win an argument against Milton Friedman. Um, her coming later 
um, toward in academia. How was her experience different from Mary Paley's? Well, I, I think she has the two. One of the the things that, that the two of them have in common is a a tenacity, and, as well as a kind of intellectual curiosity. So, but the tenacity is what I really want to focus on because uh, you know her background. She was an immigrant. Um, she was uh, immigrated to the U.S. from what was then the Soviet Union and is now Ukraine. And, um, and so a, a very kind of, again, intellectually oriented family, but coming in as an immigrant. And uh, I think she had been, um, uh, they ended up settling in, in Oregon and she was doing her undergraduate at Reed College in, in Portland. And, and so she was you know, doing, you know, doing her, her scholarship. And this is in the you know, 1920s, 1930s. So, so, you know, we're talking a good 50 years later and also in the U.S. Her older brother, Aaron, Aaron Director, was a student at Chicago, at the University of Chicago. And he wrote back to her and basically said, hey, it's great here. You'd love it. You should come to Chicago. And so she did, and um, and so she started. She uh, enrolled in the PhD program in economics at Chicago, and um, he he was uh, in his own right. Um, Aaron Director was uh, an important influence in the development of the quote unquote Chicago School and the growth of law and economics as a separate field. And so, so there's a whole separate story we could conversation we could have about him, but uh, he was he was formative in in getting his little sister to Chicago, and at one of the um, one of the kind of uh, graduate student events in 1932, I think it was. So you're, she's at a grad grad student event, and she's sitting there. You know, I think it's some, something about they're sitting in alphabetical order, and D is next to F. And so she's sitting next to this guy named Milton Friedman, and they start talking, and you know, the the rest is history. Uh, and they had a very a very long and um, you know very happy marriage. Uh, I think he he passed away in two thousand six. I want to say. And, uh, you know, they were, were constant companions, constant intellectual companions, um, you know, throughout their lives. And um, it's a style of collaboration very different from the Marshalls, you know, that they, um, I think, were much more kind of, you know, public, public facing collaborations uh, that, that I'm sure we will want to dig into. Oh, absolutely. Um, I do want to talk about her initial contributions uh, before Friedman was added to her name. She has a number of publications as Rose Director. Um, one of those, it, the early work with, I believe, Dorothy... Dorothy Brady. Dorothy Brady, um, mm -hmm. work on how income affects people's spending behavior. Kind of sounds a bit like what Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize for later in his life. Yeah, and that's a connection that you saw that I didn't make in the chapter, but I think it's right that um, you know she's she's doing some very detailed data work, very detailed empirical work on um, how differences in income levels and the income distribution in general, how that affects household savings and household expenditures. And, and so it's looking at these kind of life cycle patterns of savings and expenditures yeah. from a, a just very detailed data-driven um, analysis. And then, you know, Milton probably, you know, is because I'm sure she's like writing the working paper and gives it to him and says, hey, can you give me comments? And and he gives her comments, and then one of the comments probably is, you know, I wonder why they're making those decisions. 
right? Because th this is what every economist asks, right? Is I wonder why, and then fill in the blank for whatever your observation is. And so, so I'm sure the two of them were talking about, you know, what do you think explains the pattern of income distribution, you know, differences in savings at higher or lower incomes. And, um, and that led to, you know, I, I, that was a, a period of time where he was developing his work on permanent income hypothesis, which um, I will defer to you to explain. <laughs> yeah, so permanent income hypothesis is really about, um, well, we can, it's policy relevant because if we think about things like stimulus payments, they tend to be one-off payments. And so the kind of puzzle when we have stimulus is, you know, why do people save so much of it? They don't spend very much of it. You would think with this extra income, they would go out and spend it on, you know, whatever they're feeling. Um, but the idea of permanent income hypothesis is they don't really change their spending and consumption behavior all that much unless the change in the income is seen as a permanent change to your income, mm -hmm. right? So if I get a raise at my job and that's going to be a permanent increase to in my income, then I'm going to maybe consume and spend yeah. a little bit more. But if it's just a temporary uh, bump to my income, not so much. Um, so definitely can see how that work started uh, to be connected. Yep. Um, but they had a pretty, as you said, they were kind of public intellectuals. They worked on a book and then a TV series, Free to Choose. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And kind of, they had some major practical impact on especially US public policy. Yep. And I think it, it even starts before that, of, you know, Friedman's, Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, that was from a, a set of speeches he gave, but then turned into a book. And I think that was 1962. Yeah, 1962. And, um, you know, I think at the time, Rose was, um, they they had started a family, so she's busy with kids and so on. But she's still, and he credits her in the acknowledgments. You know, she's still basically giving him comments on his manuscripts, and you know, giving him comments on speeches and and you know, reading his working papers and things like that. Um, and so I think that's that's one thing that that you definitely see from both both of these women is that just because they've started families doesn't mean they've checked out intellectually. They've, they are still, you know, hey, let me read that, or hey, I can give you some comments. Mm -hmm. you know. um, and, but then in the 1970s, um, you know, Milton Friedman is moving very much, you know, and he's, he's got this, you know, great set of, of scholarly work that he's done. Uh, you know, technical microeconomic theory, macroeconomic theory, um, monetary theory, and is moving in more of a policy direction. And definitely through the 1970s, he's becoming more of a public intellectual. He had a regular column in Newsweek magazine. And, you know, this was a time when there were kind of some dueling ideologies in terms of the public intellectuals, because you've got Milton Friedman and his more market-oriented uh, column. And in terms of more kind of industrial policy, you've got people like John Kenneth Galbraith, who are also out there doing very public-facing um, public intellectual work. And so one, th one thing that... Um, that they decide to do in the late 70s is a PBS, a public broadcasting show in the US called Free to Choose. And I think a lot of this, at least from what I could see in terms of, you know, reading the backstory and the, the um, you know, the, the, the autobiography that they co-wrote together, 
uh, I think that a lot of this was kind of Rose's idea. You know, hey, you've you know you're developing all these ideas. You know, let's go out and you know ex you can explain them to people in ways that they can understand and they can apply in their own lives. And and so it's a typical you know it's a typical public TV series where you've got like you know I think it's twelve episodes. And they each are, you know, set in in some particular location. I'm remembering the one uh, that talked about unemployment, and at the time it was set in my hometown of Pittsburgh. And there was, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, that's a separate conversation. Yes, we we'll have to have that conversation. <laughs> What's the recording's off? Um, and, and, you know, this is a time when a lot of the steel mills are downsizing. And so there's quite a bit of unemployment and this conversation about household expenditures and income and savings. And also, how do you define unemployment? There's structural, there's frictional, there's... Um, and so he's putting this all in this context, but on the ground in conversation with actual workers who are either have experienced unemployment or are potentially facing unemployment, the risk of unemployment. And so there's a lot of that kind of real on the ground, folksy, talking to people, making the economics real. And, um, and I think it's, the, it's the, the kind of collaborative brainchild of both of them. And Milton was the public face of it. Uh, and then they wrote a book that was a product, you know, a follow-on product out of the TV show. And I think Rose took the lead on that writing, but it was truly, you know, a collaborative, a, a collaborative venture and had a lot of impact on, you know, that was when I was in high school, um, you know, that was my first exposure to economics was seeing the free to choose videos. One of, one of my teachers is just like, oh, you know, we're going to do a unit on economics and, you know, put the, put the video in the cassette in the player and hit play. And I'm going to go down to the lounge and have a coffee. You guys watch free to choose. And it was great. It transformed my life. I remember one of the first um, like summer economic seminars I went to, they showed a few segments from Free to Choose. And it was, you know, dated at the time. It seemed a little bit dated, but it was still incredibly relevant. Um, what are some of the big policy conversations that changed as a result of that? I think the the unemployment. And, you know, and this was in the in the late 1970s. This was a time when macroeconomic policy was very fraught, right? So you've got from the from the mid 1930s onward, you've had this growth of Keynesian macro policy. And I'm I'm not a macroeconomist, so I'm just going to be very superficial in my <laughs> description of this, but. You know, the, the idea that you can use fiscal policy to try to manage a large, complex economy to a particular range of outcomes. And, you know, the, the argument that there, you know, that um, boom and bust cycles come from, say, a shortfall in demand. And so you need to boost incomes to boost demand. And so that's why you make, you know, subsidy payments to people so that they go out and consume more. Um, and, and so on that kind of fiscal policy level, you get disagreement between Keynesians and, and Friedman, who would be, I would guess, I would call it a more classical uh, argument that, um, it's production that drives economic activity, not consumption. And so you got to start with the production. And, you know, so this aggregate demand stimulus is going to do nothing but produce inflation. And um, good old Say's law. Good old Say's law. And, um, and then the other piece of, of macro policy that was very fraught that Friedman was participating in at this time was monetary policy. You know, in the late 1960s, uh, I think the U.S. went off the gold standard. There was all of this fixed versus floating exchange rates. Um, 
and the you know, the very kind of Friedman monetarist position that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, and then you take that into the 1970s and you've got this period of inflation and high unemployment. And the inflation was a consequence of some of the policies that had been implemented to try to deal with the high unemployment. And then you've got layered on top of that, the 1974 OPEC oil uh, restrictions, and then the 78-79 Iran-Iraq war. Um, so just macro policy was, <laughs> it was a mess. And so there was a lot to talk about. But having this very folksy, layperson-oriented conversation around, here's what this technical economics means for you in your situation, that that was a, a huge contribution and, and unprecedented. Yeah, I mean, they got people to pay attention to arguments in favor of school choice, which nobody had really been talking about at all. Um, they got people to question the validity of, of military conscription, right? And challenge you know, the role that unions were playing in some of the unemployment and other economic problems that the US was experiencing. Um, and they did it in a way, as you said, that was relatable and targeted towards a non-expert audience because the majority of voters are non-expert audiences. <laughs> and we in academia tend to kind of overlook that aspect of, of what we should be doing. Yep, yep. And I think, yeah, the, the, in medicine, they call it translational research, right? That there is this actual field of research that is taking the very, very arcane, technical, detailed lab work and translating it into application and use and comprehension uh, for the, the non-lab scientists. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I think we in economics could learn a lot from giving giving the same kind of, of status and credit to that translational to that translational work. It's really was, important, and they did they did a great job of it. I was just trying to think: who are the people in economics that are doing those types of things today? I can think of Russ Roberts doing you know, focusing on communicating ideas to a broader audience, but there's not a lot of it. Milton Friedman was on Phil Donahue's show. He was a, he was as much of a household name as any economist will ever hope to be. Yeah. <laughs> so they, there was this really important emphasis on education that the Friedmans had. Um, and so it wasn't just the, the Free to Choose series, but later they did establish their own foundation that was focused on, on econ ed. Yep, the Free to Choose Foundation. And, and so a lot, of their, you know, a lot of their effort in their later years went to having this kind of more popular facing set of conversations around economic ideas and popularizing the economic way of thinking. Um, and I think that's, and then that's, again, another, another commonality across these two women is the emphasis on education in, and you can see it in their different, you know, in the different generations and different cultural contexts that, you know, Mary Paley is very focused on the first generations of women getting a first class university education, even if they can't get the degree at Cambridge. And then Rose, Director Friedman, is have is focusing on the more popular communication, and so you see the evolution of economic ideas through through their different roles. Yeah, and you know their own experiences kind of influencing that as well. I'm sure Rose's experience leaving the Ukraine to come to the United States, being an immigrant, fleeing a country that did not have as sound economic policies as the one that she went to. 
um, all of this probably shaped the way they not only see the world, but the way they wanted to help other people see the world too. Yep. Um, so any last words on these two trailblazers? Definitely, I think we could use that word to describe them both. Yeah, I, I agree. And it was very fun to have, as an author, to have this opportunity to go back and and read their work and, and be able to share it with everyone. So, um, Well, if anybody is interested in learning more, um, Dr. Kiesling has a wonderful chapter in the Essential Women of Liberty book on these two wonderful scholars. And at the end of that chapter, there's a great list of resources that you can look at yourself. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Lynn. Oh, thank you. It's been a great conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. You've been listening to Essential Scholars, a new podcast series that explores the ideas and insights of some of history's most influential thinkers. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and head over to essentialscholars.org to learn more. See you next time.